Consider for a moment what it might be like to travel at 100 million miles per hour. Let's go ahead and forget about the details of accelerating to that speed and how it would probably turn you into a mass of gelatinous flesh on one side of the spacecraft if you did things too quickly, and just talk about how much distance one could cover once you actually reached this incredible velocity. You would pass the orbit of the moon in less than 10 seconds. And as promised in the title of this video, you would blow past the orbit of Mars in a half an hour. Actually, probably a bit less than that. And you would pass the orbit of Jupiter in less than five hours. Saturn in 10 hours, and you would pass the orbit of Neptune and leave the solar system, at least as far as the planets are concerned, in just over a day. At this phenomenal rate of speed, one could be excused for thinking that even the stars wouldn't be too far beyond our reach. However, it's still an enormous distance between Earth and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, even at this colossal velocity. Because 100 million miles per hour is actually only 47,000 kilometers per second, or 16% of the speed of light. Only. 16% of the speed of light, meaning that the closest star to our own is still more than two decades in the distance, even at this incredible speed. So it would seem that traveling at this velocity is the slowest that we could travel if we wanted to send, say, an unmanned probe to Proxima Centauri in a reasonable amount of time, or a manned mission if an adult wanted to commit the rest of their life to such a trip, which doesn't seem to be the most realistic of scenarios. So how can these kinds of velocities be achieved, especially given the fact that traveling at this speed is still not really quite fast enough? Is it something that's within the capability of our current technology? Well, actually it is, but one important factor needs to be removed if you want to have the slightest hope of accelerating a significant mass up to this speed. And that is the main thing that has made our space travel possible up to this point. Propellant. Propellant needs to be removed from the equation, which is the heaviest part of any rocket, any space travel system that's been created up to this point. That has to go if we want to have the slightest hope of reaching for the stars. Good afternoon, star travelers, and once again, welcome to the angry astronaut still struggling this wretched disease, whatever the heck it is that I've got on some antibiotics. I think it's helping out, but it's probably going to take a little while for me to get better. In the meantime, I'll keep putting out content to the best of my ability. So before we start talking about some of the faster propellantless solutions out there, we need to talk about the basic way to remove propellant, indeed to remove the entire propulsion system from a spacecraft and still achieve significant velocities. And I think most of us are familiar with this technology. It's called a solar sail. And we've actually deployed a number of experimental solar sails in recent years with varying degrees of success, including the Icarus solar sail built by JAXA and depicted here that utilizes the gentle pressure of solar light particles onto its surface as a persistent source of motion, and if captured correctly, can generate a net acceleration of the sail and the attached spacecraft in the chosen direction of travel. The thrust is approximately two times higher when the surface of the solar sail is highly reflective as opposed to being highly absorbing. The absorption and reflection of the sun's radiation and the resulting radiation pressure play a significant role in the behavior of objects within the solar system, such as comets and the direction and orientation of their tails. But, as we all know, the pressure of solar radiation is not sufficient to provide a very significant amount of acceleration, unless, of course, your solar sail is extremely close to the sun. If you were to make a very close approach
approach with a solar sail, you might actually be able to achieve a speed of 2, 3%, or even 5% of the speed of light, assuming that your sail didn't melt in the process. Now, the main problem with any photon drive, whether we're talking about a solar sail or a laser sail that we'll be discussing a little bit later on, is the small amount of energy that gets transferred by photons to the spacecraft in question. Photons have very, very little mass, and even though they're traveling at just about the speed of light, the energy transference that you get to a spacecraft, even to a highly reflective solar sail is so minuscule that you need lots and lots of photons to achieve any kind of significant acceleration, meaning that sunlight isn't enough and what you actually need is an immensely powerful laser beam, preferably in orbit where you don't have to worry about atmospheric interference reducing the amount of energy required to deliver acceleration. But even with an immensely powerful laser, we're talking with gigawatts worth of energy behind it, it's still not a lot of energy being transferred to the spacecraft, meaning that you need a very, very lightweight spacecraft in order to achieve speeds anything like 100 million miles an hour. This is the objective of the Breakthrough Starshot mission, by the way, that I've talked about a number of times on this channel, whereby immensely powerful lasers are used to push very, very lightweight spacecraft. We're talking perhaps a kilogram for the entire spacecraft in question, up to a speed of about 20% of the speed of light. And of course, as I've said, the reason this is such a problem is because of the extremely low mass of photons. You need enormous numbers of photons being delivered to a highly reflective surface to get any thrust at all, and immense numbers of photons to get get even the smallest spacecraft up to a percentage of the speed of light. So how do you change this? How do you increase the amount of mass that a photon has when it's striking your sail? Doesn't seem like a very realistic prospect. I mean, photons weigh what photons weigh. Well, here's one possible solution. Photons don't lose their momentum when they reflect off the target. In other words, when they reflect off the sail, they are still traveling at the same velocity when they travel in reverse, meaning that a series of immobile mirrors or mirrored platforms could re-reflect the laser beam several times back to the spacecraft. As a matter of fact, the process could be repeated hundreds of times, generating as much as 770 times the desired thrust with the same amount of energy being delivered to the laser. Now, another solution would be to hit your sail with a heavier particle than a photon, but still traveling close to the speed of light. Utilizing your laser, for example, to ionize an onboard propellant and to push those charged ions into your sail at speeds approaching that of light. In other words, particles much, much heavier than photons striking your sail, producing a lot more thrust than the laser alone can provide. Now, another possibility, if you want to carry at least some propellant on your ship, is to use the laser to excite the propellant to incredibly high velocity. Superheating propellant, much in the same way as a nuclear thermal engine would, but with an even higher temperature. And the types of velocities that you could get out of such a propellant would be 10 times the efficiency of a chemical rocket. Now, that's not nearly as good as photon propulsion, at least in terms of efficiency, but still getting the same thrust as a chemical rocket can provide with 10 times the efficiency, in other words, your propellant lasts 10 times as long, is still pretty good five times as good as nuclear propulsion anyway. Now, one of the biggest problems with any of these photonic systems is the diffraction of the laser beam in question. 
even though lasers seem like they maintain a very coherent beam over great distances, they actually don't. With every 10,000 kilometers or so, a laser beam doubles in size, and of course it loses its intensity and usefulness more and more as the distance continues to increase, meaning that you want to deliver as much energy as possible to your laser sail while the ship is close to the laser. The further away you get, the less effective the laser is going to be, although a sizable sail can make up for part of that problem because even a diffracted laser beam will strike the entirety of a laser sail and still provide the same amount of thrust. But the further you get, the bigger your sail has to be, and the bigger your sail is, the more the ship weighs. So it's a bit of a catch-22, and one of the few solutions to this, or a way to make up for part of this problem, is to carry a laser on the ship as well. Now, of course, you also need a nuclear reactor or some other power source for the laser, which kind of defeats the purpose to some degree, but nevertheless, it would allow you to make course corrections, slight adjustments to velocity, and that sort of thing once you get so far from your laser source on Earth that it's no longer very useful. But of course, I can hear a lot of you asking another very important question. How do you slow down? Unless you have another massive laser array waiting for you at Proxima Centauri to provide braking thrust, you're just going to go flying through the Proxima system at 16 or 17 percent of the speed of light, never to be seen again. Well, there is another solution, a couple of ways to slow down, actually. One is to use the laser sail as a solar sail when you arrive in the Proxima system. How can that be beneficial? Official? Well, first of all, the light from the star is going to provide braking thrust, a certain amount of braking thrust as you approach the solar system in question. But if you make a very close approach to the star, in other words, approximately two to five solar radiuses distance from the sun, and of course you'd have to do that without melting your spacecraft in the process, you could decelerate as much as 300 kilometers per second. Not a lot, but still 0.1% of the speed of light. You would need to combine that with a magnetic sail. What's that? Well, a magnetic sail is something that you deploy ahead of your spacecraft, and it utilizes magnetic fields to provide thrust in the opposite direction. So instead of photons providing reverse thrust, it's magnetic fields providing reverse thrust on your magnetic sail and therefore the rest of the spacecraft. And with this combination of utilizing the photons from Proxima Centauri, Proxima Centauri's magnetic field, and perhaps an onboard laser providing reverse thrust as well, you could slow down sufficiently in order to be captured by the gravity of this trinary star system. System. By the way, all of these scientific principles are well understood, and the technology associated with them are also well understood. Of course, it's going to require a significant amount of investment, especially if we're talking about the lasers. The lasers are going to be immensely powerful and require an enormous amount of energy in order to do the job, but still, it is theoretically within the capability of our civilization to accomplish something like this. And if we were to power up a civilization substantially, in other words, a civilization that's capturing a substantial percentage of their sun's energy with a Dyson sphere, for example, they could push enormous amounts of mass to speeds as high as 50% of the speed of light on a regular basis basis, and perhaps this would be one of the most compelling reasons for a civilization to build a Dyson Sphere in the first place, because the energy that it requires to cross the vast gulfs of space between the stars, no matter what propulsion system you use, is going to be immense, and until we harness these types of energies, we are probably going to be restricted to our own solar system, and at best, primitive nuclear power sources. But as I said, it's certainly within our capability to build interstellar transportation, but the biggest thing that's missing is the will to do so. 
Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon or PayPal, or if you like, you can also hit that super thanks button. Either way, I will enter you into a contest for a couple pieces of history, a couple of pieces of the Boca Chica launch facility, although keep in mind I can only ship to North America or to European destinations. Very sorry about that. But if you live in those places and want to support the channel, all the details are in the description. So until next time, stay angry about space.